Okay, everybody. Normally, Jens chairs these things in his capacity as faculty director of research, but since he is the honoree, or, or roasty maybe, um, he, he's turned this over to me even though I'm going to be presenting. I just wanted to very briefly introduce the speakers so that we didn't take too much time, can get right on to things. Um, but in the order we're speaking, the, uh, the, the people who are going to be commenting on Jens's book are Matthew Evangelista, who's a professor in the government department here at Cornell, uh, who, who writes on ethics and war. Um, I'm Brad Wendell. I write on ethics and political philosophy and legal philosophy. And the third speaker is Claire Finkelstein from the University of Pennsylvania, who is the director of a center on ethics and the rule of law. And she sponsors really terrific conferences down at Penn, bringing people together around issues of national security, the rule of law, and ethics. And of course, the honoree is our uh, very own Jens Olin. And his book is entitled The Assault on International Law. Each of us will speak for about 10 or 12 minutes or so, and then we'll give Jens time to respond, and then we'll take uh, questions from the audience. So, you know, while, while you're listening, think of some really uh, hard questions and stump him uh, as a way of honoring him. So thank you, and uh, first, Professor Evangelista. Thanks very much for the invitation. I'm really pleased to participate in this happy occasion. I volunteered to go first uh, for a couple of reasons. One, so that you would wait for me as I rushed over from my class that finished at 12.05. Uh, and the second was uh, because I thought, as a non-specialist, I could give a kind of introductory overview of this uh, book uh, that is so wide-ranging and touches on so many uh, areas in philosophy, law, uh, ethics uh, and politics. Uh, so I think I should start by offering you my qualifications for being an unqualified uh, reader, uh, a non-specialist. Uh, my background is in history and literature, political science and international relations in graduate school. And uh, even though, uh, unlike the author who's a specialist in philosophy and law, which are areas that I uh, have for a long time uh, been, uh, been pretty ignorant of. My early work was on the U.S.-Soviet nuclear arms race. Uh, and even though arms control had as its objective international treaties to limit the risk of nuclear war, uh, in my field of political science, we didn't think of that as international law. Uh, that gives you an idea of how wide the gap was uh, between international relations and international law. And it's narrowing, uh, I would say, and this book is a big contribution to helping, to helping it narrow because it engages with uh, a political science uh, tradition uh, of, of realism, uh, different from the legal uh, realism, different from moral realism in philosophy, as I learned at, at dinner last night. Again, I'm trying to maintain my non-expert uh, uh, status here. Uh, but therefore linked uh, to politics and, and, and political science. Uh, this gap is narrowing for a number of reasons. For me personally, I realized I had to learn more about ethics and law of warfare when I was studying Russia's war uh, in Chechnya because there were so many obvious uh, violations of human rights uh, and the laws of war. And I was fortunate to have uh, a teacher, uh, a colleague in Henry Shu of the political philosopher who then moved uh, to Oxford. Uh, on legal issues, I think the turning point for me and for many uh, of us in the field of political science uh, were the attacks of September 2001 and the reaction of the Bush administration. Uh, and at that point, I was really motivated to learn more. I was able to work uh, with uh, Jens' predecessor, uh, David Whitman, uh, who was a patient uh, and, uh, and quite expert teacher in matters related to international humanitarian law, uh, and we did uh, a project together uh, on, that, on that topic. But I think even for the lay person, uh, international law came to the fore with the Bush administration's reaction to uh, the attacks of September 11th, because no matter what you thought about U.S. adherence to international law, uh, during the previous administrations, there were some striking violations that were obvious to anybody reading, uh, reading a newspaper. Uh, the capture of suspected terrorists or terrorist suspects, and you'll remember, those of you who are old enough, uh, 
that the word suspect was hardly ever used. Terrorists put in indefinite detention uh, in places like Guantanamo Bay, in secret so-called black sites elsewhere in the world. We're not even sure where uh, they were. Uh, that seemed like a violation of something, even if you didn't uh, know uh, the law. Uh, these captives were not, uh, according to the Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, entitled uh, to any rights under the Geneva, uh, any protections under the Geneva Conventions. He later had to qualify that uh, a bit. Um, and then torture. Okay, everybody knew torture was wrong uh, and illegal, and little by little the evidence that it was practiced uh, by U.S. Uh, forces and U.S. agents uh, came out. Uh, I had already been getting the sense that there was something unusual about the Bush administration's uh, approach uh, to law. As I learned a bit about the Geneva Conventions, I heard about this thing called Article 5 in the Third Geneva Convention uh, that provides for a way to assess whether someone captured actually uh, deserves the protections as a prisoner of war uh, under, the, under the conventions. And the practice was to establish uh, what were known in the language of the, uh, of, the, of the convention as competent tribunals uh, to assess that person's status. Uh, and I learned that in uh, a previous war, the 1991 uh, Gulf War, uh, the U.S. had uh, processed nearly 1,200 uh, captives under Article 5 to find out whether they actually uh, qualified as prisoners of war or whether, for example, they were civilians. Uh, 300 of them turned out to be civilians and they were just uh, released. Uh, this practice was so ingrained in the professional U.S. military uh, that in their own rules they refer to these as Article 5 tribunals because they're not international tribunals uh, at The Hague or uh, or, uh, or Strasbourg. They're tribunals that are made up of U.S. military officers on the scene with knowledge about the circumstances under which the person uh, was captured, and there's no right of appeal. Uh, so these tribunals are fully in the control of the administration to decide what to do with these captives, uh, yet the Bush administration uh, did not convene them. It was harder, I would think, for the professional military not to convene them than to convene them. It was the normal practice. Uh, and uh, so that made me wonder, what is it about these, uh, these laws and norms that the Bush administration uh, finds so objectionable? And, and this is where uh, Jens Olin's new book uh, helped me a lot in ways that discussions with uh, an equally expert uh, legal specialist such as David Whitman uh, didn't. He looks into uh, the intellectual history, kind of sociology, of the emergence of the Bush administration's animus to international law. And he finds it in a group of legal scholars, some of whom worked within the Bush administration, others not, uh, that he calls the, the new realists. Uh, so the first two chapters of the book basically tell the story of these people, and some of the names, uh, maybe all of them, will be familiar uh, to you. Uh, Eric Posner, Jack Goldsmith, uh, John Yu, uh, Adrian Vermeule. And, and what he does is not just tell the story of their involvement in the politics of the administration, but also their legal scholarship, how especially uh, Goldsmith uh, and Posner drew uh, on the Erie decision to make, sense, to make the claim that there's no such thing as, uh, as international customary law that has any binding constraint on, on U.S. practices uh, at all. And what, what Jens does that's so wonderful in those chapters is he engages the legal arguments themselves as he's telling uh, what is at least in part a political story. A possible criticism would be uh, that he doesn't pay a lot of attention to uh, the causal uh, mechanisms that, that these views influence these policymakers, uh, because possibly there's no story there to tell. It could very well be that the inclination of the Bush administration was to ignore international law anyhow, uh, but it was helpful to have uh, this cadre of, of lawyers who are making consistent arguments. And I think that we, we could push Jens on this. I think this might be the kind of argument he's making. What's interesting to me is that the legal arguments had to be made. 
uh, that John Yu thought it was necessary to say that these practices that look illegal on their face are in fact not, not illegal. Uh, and so there's a kind of paradox here that you have lawyers writing about international law essentially arguing that there's no such thing as international law. It reminds me of the Republican uh, and Libertarian uh, candidates who run for office on an anti-government platform. Well, why do you want to hold office in government if you're, if you're anti-government? It's, it's a similar kind of paradox. And, uh, and, and I think it raises much deeper questions about uh, what is the understanding of law? How does law uh, actually constrain uh, a country like, uh, like the United States, even when uh, the top political figures, albeit trained as lawyers, don't really, don't really believe in it? So that takes up a couple of chapters, not answering all my questions. Uh, but then... Uh, Jens hones into a, an area where uh, I'm uh, not particularly well qualified uh, to, uh, to speak, but uh, my colleagues on the panel uh, are actually going to focus on those. That's where he argues that uh, the, uh, the basis for uh, the new realists' understanding of law uh, comes from their understanding of rationality, uh, their use of rational choice theory, uh, and also uh, simple uh, game theoretic concepts like the prisoner's dilemma. This actually goes back to my earlier training, and I had certain kind of PTSD symptoms uh, sometimes <laughs> reading about, uh, about that. But, uh, but Yen's treatment is, uh, is very clear and very interesting, and uh, not, to, uh, not to spoil uh, what, what follows, he basically argues there has to be a broader notion uh, of rationality uh, that he calls uh, based on constrained uh, maximization. So he has a couple of chapters uh, that uh, I think philosophers and ethicists uh, will love, economists uh, probably not so much, uh, but, but anyway, very much uh, worth reading. Uh, then where the book goes is into a treatment of some of the major issues that have been debated uh, regarding the war on terror and the response uh, to the Al-Qaeda uh, attacks. Uh, issues like uh, targeted killing uh, by drones. Uh, issues like, are there really only two categories, combatants uh, and non-combatants? Uh, what about civilians who take up arms at certain points, who plant roadside bombs, who uh, carry out suicide uh, attacks? How should they be treated under the law? And, and I really recommend this section to you, and I wish uh, I could talk uh, more about it even in an unexpert uh, way uh, because Yen's positions might surprise you. Uh, given that he's criticizing an assault on international law, uh, favors uh, U.S. adherence to international law in its interests, rationality understood the way he has uh, reformulated it. He doesn't take your standard international lawyer working for the International Committee of the Red Cross position on a lot of these issues. It's very interesting stuff, and I, and I recommend it to you very highly. The final uh, chapter is uh, a case for uh, reintegrating the United States in uh, the system of international law, especially international institutions like the International Court of Justice, like the International Criminal Court, the United Nations uh, itself. Uh, and again, it's a kind of uh, sandwich, uh, if you like, uh, the uh, the politics, the policy relevance uh, comes in the early chapters uh, and the later chapters, uh, the hard stuff, uh, but worth your time uh, in the middle. Uh, I commend the book to you very highly. Well, if this is a sandwich structure, I guess I'm the, I'm the burger. Uh, <laughs> because I, I, I found myself really fascinated by this stuff in the middle. We, we hadn't intended to divide this up in this way, but, but I'm a, you know, Professor Evangelista says he's not a, an expert in this area, not a specialist. I'm not even interested in this area. Um, the, <laughs> it, it, international law is just not something that I've ever really been all that interested in. I'm a legal theorist and a domestic law kind of guy, but I found the book absolutely riveting and really helpful. I'm going to cite it constantly, and it really clarified a lot of issues that are 
of importance in moral philosophy generally, legal theory generally, domestic law. Um, it, it's, it's far broader and deeper than just a response to this new realist attack on international law. Uh, so what I want to do is talk about the, the central two chapters on rationality. Um, and the, the, the two issues that come up are one in ethics and one in philosophy of law. The ethical issue is whether there's a conception of reason that takes account of the interests of others or whether rationality is just means ends rationality and realizing one's self-interest. And the legal issue is how one can account, if at all, for the normativity of law. And that is the idea that some kind of social or institutional practice can support propositions that one ought to do something. So can you make this transition from facts about the way institutions are structured to normative propositions? So on the moral philosophy side, I like to start, uh, like so many things in philosophy, with Plato. And there's a little moment, which you may remember, in The Republic, in which Socrates is defending a theory of justice against several interlocutors, including Thrasymachus. Uh, and Thrasymachus makes a move which is very familiar today as this appeal to self-interest maximization as the essence of rationality. And Thrasymachus says to Socrates, I affirm that the just is nothing else than the advantage of the stronger. Each form of government enacts the laws with a view to its own advantage, and by so legislating, they proclaim that the just for the subjects is that which is for their, that is, the ruler's advantage. Now, notice something interesting that happens here, and, and Robert Nozick first pointed this out. Uh, he said, when Thrasymachus says that justice is the interest of the stronger, and Socrates starts to question him about this, Thrasymachus should hit Socrates over the head. But of course he doesn't, right? What does he do? He, he responds to the reasons given by Socrates. And this is such an obvious point that it can be easy to miss. And that is that we all recognize a domain of reasons that cannot simply be reduced to the interests of the stronger, or in modern terminology, to rational self-interest. So if a person is in danger, that provides me with a reason to warn him of the danger. Uh, doing something will cause someone to suffer, that provides me with a reason not to to do that thing. Someone needing assistance may provide me with a reason to help him. And, and ethics, at least the way I think about it, is nothing more than the practice of giving reasons for our actions that can be endorsed by those who are affected by them. It's nothing more mysterious than, uh, as Tim Scanlon calls it, reasoning out what we owe to each other and responding appropriately to reasons. But a couple of things have happened since Plato in the history of philosophy that have made the position of rational choice theorists not only seem attractive, but actually quite difficult to dislodge. And one of those things is a gradual shift in emphasis from reasons, such as those given by Socrates to Thrasymachus, to something that you can call reason with a capital R, uh, which found its highest expression in the ethics of Kant. Uh, here's a description from Simon Blackburn, who's a critic of Kant, uh, of what he calls Kant's dream about reason with a capital R. Uh, and Blackburn says, for Kant, motivation by reason, by means of desire is one thing. Motivation by apprehension of the moral law is a different thing. And furthermore, something with absolute or categorical binding force. Morality in Kant stands apart from the world of desire and has authority over it. It is reason itself that dictates respect for the moral law, and this respect can be demanded of all rational beings simply in virtue of their rationality. Um, and if this is the conception of reason that is taken uh, by critics of moral philosophy, it's easy to say that's implausible, it's too strong. It doesn't account for conflicts of duty or duties with exceptions or duties that may bear on the, con the situation of the actor. Um, and so it seems like such an implausible conception of reason that reason itself comes in for questioning. Uh, the other significant trend can be traced through the logical positivists in the 1930s and 40s, but really I think is a manifestation of the 19th century's preoccupation with natural sciences as the most reliable source of all knowledge. Now, anything that can't be made subject to observation and testing using the methods of empirical science was regarded with great suspicion. The idea of values that can't be reduced to something measurable, like preferences and self-interest, was ruled out of discourse as somehow ontologically or epistemically suspect, like Plato's forms. Uh, in, in moral philosophy, John Mackey famously asked, what 
are these things called moral facts or objective values? How do they fit in with the furniture of the universe? How do we come to have knowledge of these things? How do they feature in our deliberation? And those questions are hard to answer if the methods of natural sciences constitute the paradigm for answering any serious questions. And this view is often summed up in the so-called naturalistic fallacy or Hume's problem, which is that you can't derive an ought from an is. You can't derive normative statements from descriptive ones, and that leads us to the problem of legal realism. Now, I want to take a moment and give a note about this dangerous term realism. Uh, Mackey and, and David Hume were anti-realists about moral theory which is they denied the claim that, there are state, that, that statements are true and false in virtue of a reality existing independent of us. Legal realists, however, as Jens uses the term here, uh, calling them new realists, are not the same as moral realists. The American legal realists of the 1930s had a lot in common with philosophical naturalists who were skeptical about the status of moral facts. This strand of legal realism sought to do away with reference to what Felix Cohen called transcendental nonsense. That is, uh, for example, the claim with which we're all familiar that minimum wage laws are unconstitutional because they limit the freedom of contract. Legal realists were trying to show that references to something like the freedom of contract were just vivid metaphors or heuristic devices that at best summarized and at worst obscured the real reasons for judicial decisions. Now that's fine if this kind of realism merely directs lawyers to consider the underlying policy considerations that make legal doctrine intelligible. None of us at Cornell Law School, at least, believe in teaching transcendental nonsense. We try to show, for example, that strict liability for defective products makes sense in light of social goals, such as accident cost avoidance and loss spreading. So this legacy of legal realism that reminds lawyers that the law is meant to serve social goals is entirely a good thing. But there's a dark side to the legacy of legal realism, and that is the extreme skepticism it has bequeathed us about values or normative statements. According to legal realists of this stripe, one would be mistaken to believe that a legal rule has the capacity to create reasons. For example, the duty of reasonable care may seem to obligate me to conduct my activities in certain ways for the protection of others, but as Oliver Wendell Holmes famously suggested in The Path of the Law, we can wash the language of duty in cynical acid and strip away all that is not essential to understanding the concept of legal duty. And after this cynical bath, what we're left with is nothing but self-interest. Understood in this way, a legal duty means only that if I fail to do something, certain nasty things might result, such as the sheriff showing up at my house to seize my property. So on this Holmesian view, nothing more is needed to understand the concept of law than self-interest. If you want to know what the law permits or requires, just ask the proverbial bad man, who doesn't care about anything but himself and is concerned only with avoiding unpleasantness. But of course, this gives you an incredibly thin or even non-existent account of legal normativity. The law doesn't create reasons, it merely bootstraps off reasons an agent already has, namely the desire to avoid unpleasant consequences. If the agent has the power to avoid sanctions, and in the, natural, uh, the na international law context, if the agent is a powerful state, and the law in question is international law, then there's no reason to do what the law prescribes. This conception of the law makes no room for what HLA Hart calls the puzzled person, who is curious what the law requires, as opposed to merely what his own self-interest consists of. And this dark side of the legal realist legacy is what Jens identifies in the position of the so-called new realists. New realists hold that states act only in their self-interest, and that any non-self-interested reasons they may offer in justification are just posturing. But the new realists actually want to go even farther than this and say, as a conceptual matter, there can be no puzzled men or puzzled states. Everyone is a bad man in Holmes' terms or a bad state because rationality demands this. Thus, when people act apparently as puzzled states or puzzled people, they are simply confused. They're either irrational or engaged in some kind of elaborate strategy of self-deception or rhetorical posturing. Now, Jens's arguments, Posner, Goldsmith, Yu, Vermeule, have an extremely ambitious argument going all the way down from international law through theories of the concept of law and legal normativity to foundations and conceptions of rational action. And the great thing about this book is that Jens meets them on their own territory, attacking them for the methodological mistakes they make right from the get-go in their specific conception of rational action that they rely upon.
This argumentative move that Jens makes doesn't rely on some Kantian conception of universal reason, which represents the interests of all impartially. Rather, it starts, and in a very sympathetic way, starts by conceding the position of the new realists, which is that rationality at least can be maximizing one's own self-interest, but goes on to show that rational maximizers of this type can come to regard the law as genuinely creating reasons for action, that is, having normativity, not being merely a useful heuristic for prediction, predicting when sanctions will be imposed. This type of strategy of giving a two-level account of a type of reasoning is familiar in moral philosophy from works such as John Rawls' paper, Two Concepts of Rules, which he wrote while he was on the Cornell Philosophy Department, by the way. Um, and the idea is, at least in this paper by Rawls, there may be long-run utilitarian considerations that justify the adoption of a disposition to act on non-utilitarian reasons, such as promises or rules. Similarly, in the theories of rational action, David Gautier and others have attempted to show that it may be rational for agents to refrain from maximizing the realization of their interests in a particular case, because in the long run they do better if they adopt a disposition or strategy not to defect in prisoner's dilemma type situations. And Gautier uses the language of being a constrained maximizer of one's own self-interest as opposed to being a straightforward maximizer. And a constrained maximizer can make prior commitments to herself and signal those commitments to others and then act on those commitments not on a kind of thin slice, moment in time, balance of self-interested reasons when the opportunity to defect presents itself. Now the new realists, by contrast, are trading on a conception of rationality that requires rational agents to be a straightforward maximizer at every single point in time. And this worldview does not allow for a conception of rationality that allows for the possibility of forming plans, intentions, strategies, dispositions, or the like, such that it may be considered rational to stick by one's own prior commitments. Now, I'm, in order to keep this thing moving, I want to skip the discussion of the toxin puzzle, which I love. Maybe Professor Finkelstein will talk about it. But it's a fantastic counterexample to Gautier. And uh, Jens provides a really good response to, to Kafka and others who cite the, uh, the toxin puzzle as a counterexample to his conception of rationality. But just to sum up Jens's argument in chapters 3 and 4, he wants to insist that it's possible at least, not necessary, but possible for an agent to evaluate options not in fine time slices, moment by moment, but in larger chunks. And chunk-based evaluation may be rational for a number of reasons, including reasons given by Michael Bratman. We are boundedly rational creatures, and it's exhausting and potentially overwhelming to reevaluate one's choices at every moment in time. So we therefore adopt strategies such as planning and commitment to reduce the cost of deliberation. The normativity of law on this account can be seen as deriving from the rationality of adopting plans, intentions, and dispositions to do something that is in an agent's long-run best interests. The contrast, therefore, between the puzzled man and the bad man is not, as the new realists would have it, between a rational actor and someone who somehow fails to understand what his own self-interest requires. Rather, it may be rational to accept that the law may create reasons for action because it's rational at some prior point in time to adopt constraints on one's own utility-maximizing behavior as viewed from the vantage point of future choices. Now, the only it's not even really a criticism, it's just sort of a problem that I'll point out with this, is that it may be possible for a constrained maximizer to revert back to being a straightforward maximizer at any point in time. So one wonders how we prevent these commitments or strategies from unwinding so that rational action at some future point in time is no longer determined by the prior commitment but by what maximizes one's self-interest in the moment. Um, Jens has some suggestions about this and says that it may be rational to adopt strategies that makes it difficult to unwind one's prior commitments. He talks, for example, about something like the Doomsday Machine in Dr. Strangelove, one of my favorite movies, uh, which of course is a strategy that makes it impossible to defect from the cooperative solution at some future point in time. 
I think the answer to this question may end up being um, even deeper than is explored in the book because it involves exploring the connection between rationality and morality. And it may be that an account of practical reason is dependent upon a deeper account of theoretical reason, such that uh, certain moves which would involve unwinding one's prior commitments are a violation of theoretical reason as well as practical reason. Um, I don't think Jens would be necessarily opposed to this suggestion, um, but what he wants to do in the book is to answer the new realists on their own terms without adopting a, a theory of rationality that they can simply uh, wave away. And, and, and I think he does that. I, I think he says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take all of your commitments and I will show you that you're wrong even on the basis of that. And for that reason, it's just an incredibly powerful, successful argument and one that should appeal to people both in international law and people who are concerned with uh, legal reasoning and legal normativity generally. Thanks. I'm going to start. Oh, this is far away. I'm going to start with a few personal remarks um, about Jens and how we got to know one another. <clears throat> Every once in a while, a moment's dalliance gives rise to an event that changes one's life in significant ways. This was the moment at which I first encountered Jens Olin in 2010, while working on a still and still now, unfinished book project on rational choice theory applications of the law, I came across an article on SSRN entitled Nash Equilibrium and International Law. Not only is it rare to find people working in game theory and rational choice theory as applied to law, but to find someone applying such theories to international law, another interest of mine was an exciting discovery. I looked up the author. I was further amazed to learn that this individual is not only a law professor, but a law professor with a PhD in philosophy interested in international law, criminal law, international humanitarian law, all subjects in which I took an enthusiastic interest. I decided to write him a letter. And so a friendship was born. In Jens, I discovered a true intellectual soulmate. Over the five years that I've known Jens, we have now collaborated on a number of projects. He is a member of the board of directors of the center uh, that um, Matt mentioned, uh, called the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. We've co-authored to produce a volume, uh, an edited collection on targeted killing, as well as a volume on cyber war that's about to come out. And more importantly, we've had many, many conversations on the topics uh, of rational choice theory, international law, combatants law of war, from which I continue to learn and derive great intellectual and personal sustenance. So uh, finally, in the bargain, not only did I gain an intellectual pal and a friend, but I had the privilege of getting to know Jens's family, his wife Nancy, um, and his stepson, Christopher, his lovely daughter, Clara. And I feel truly blessed to have Jens and Nancy and their family in, in my life. Now, on the book. The assault on international law is typical Jens, a beautifully written work that is creative, well-organized, insightful, and a joy to read. It is even aesthetic. The cover is elegant and evocative and perfectly captures the central themes of the book. It is also courageous, as Jens is, from its personal disclosure of the dire circumstances under which the book was written to the frank and biting criticism of productive and influential members of the legal academy. The book is like Jens, bold, ambitious, and honest. The aim of the book, and what I take to be its central motivation, namely to shore up the importance of international law based on the perception of a growing skepticism in the academy of its normative authority, are both ones I share and applaud. So my remarks today will be from the perspective of a believer, one who is already sympathetic to the project. However, rather than stressing our agreements, I will take the brief opportunity I have today to identify some possible disagreements between us on how Jens articulates the project, as well as a call for clarification at a few important junctures in the book. The first question I have is about the target of Jens's attack. The target is primarily a handful of law professors who have been writing skeptically about international law, 
Uh, these individuals whom Jens dubs the new realists uh, suggest that they do not believe that international law has any normative authority. As such, they stand, as Jens makes clear, in a long line of skeptics about normative authority. Working from narrower to broader, there are those who, like these authors, write about skepticism about international law. Um, Vermeule and Posner, Goldsmith were not the first, of course. Hobbes himself was deeply skeptical about international law, and as Jens indicates, so was H.L.A. Hart, for that matter. Then skepticism about international relations. This is an older tradition, one that comes uh, out of political theory of the 1950s and 60s, uh, from which some of the skepticism about international law draws. Then there's skepticism about the normative authority of law generally, and Brad referred to uh, legal realists. Uh, and that, of course, is both an older and a new uh, tradition, one that is persistent in the legal academy. And finally, skepticism about normativity generally. And one can trace the history of this skepticism, uh, as Brad indicated, all the way back to uh, discussions with Socrates uh, and, um, and throughout the course of discussions of normativity uh, in political theory, in law, and in moral philosophy. The question, however, is whether or not the, this particular set of doubters that Jens focuses on are the right ones to focus on. And in particular, their arguments with regard to international law. As Jens insightfully points out, the authors that he identifies have a kind of dual purpose. They run their skeptical arguments twice. He lists first the attack on international law and secondly the attack on constitutional law. In particular, they have an interest in attacking those who would limit executive authority and claim that the commander-in-chief power of Article II is a direct basis for establishing unlimited executive authority with regard to war-making powers or anything that can be construed as war-making powers. He insightfully points out that the use of the Erie Doctrine that these authors make constitutes not only an attack on federal common law, but also an attack on international law, since it would be impossible, unthinkable, to have 50 different interpretations of what international law requires. However, the sense in which I question whether or not these authors attack on international law is perhaps not the right target, is that I don't think that they regard international law or even that many in the U.S. and in our history regard international law as a robust enough target to be worth attacking. So the suggestion that there is, as the title claims, an assault on international law implicitly contains a suggestion that there is a belief in the existence of international law such that international law is worth attacking. I would suggest that the primary target of the new realists is the expansion of executive authority and the attack on those sources of possible limitations on executive authority. And that the primary thing to keep one's eye on in developments in legal theory, in constitutional law, and in discussions in and around international law is the argument of American legal scholars about the scope of executive authority. Even liberals who were formally on the side of arguing in favor of limits to executive authority have been siding with the Vermeule, Goldsmith, Posner thesis. And these arguments in some sense, as Jens nicely traces, go back to John Yu's original argument in the since uh, recanted 2002 memo in which he argues that anything, even legislation, federal legislation that would pose a limit on executive authority is 
EO IPSO unconstitutional because limits on executive authority Article II power uh, are unconstitutional. Therefore, the War Powers Act is unconstitutional. Even the federal statute against torture, which codifies the Convention Against Torture, would be on this reading and you says unconstitutional. So though the memo making this argument in 2002 was recanted and pulled by the Justice Department, its arguments live on in these constitutional scholars, and this constitutional scholarship has, continues to have an enormous impact, uh, both on the executive branch and its interpretation of its own authority, and on uh, Article III courts, who have somehow become convinced that their own authority uh, must be limited by the executive branch's view of its own interpretation of its own authority. Uh, unfortunately, justice, Article III justices have become quite constrained maximizers uh, to the detriment of the independence of the judiciary and the separation of powers. Okay. So now I want to turn to the rational choice arguments uh, and make some remarks about that and then to finish up with a, f a few remaining thoughts about the application of these arguments to international law. So Jens correctly identifies an oddity of rational agency, one in which philosophers and economists alike have spilled much ink. This is the problem in a nutshell, that when a person ha faces a choice of what to do, individual rationality counsels maximizing his or her return by making the choice that will yield the highest payoff. I'll call this following David Godier, and as Jens does as well, the best response. But sometimes the best response is not the best response, as it turns out. Sometimes by following best response, an agent will fare worse than she would if she followed a different decision strategy instead. So Jens talks about the famous case of the toxin puzzle, which is near and dear to my heart. But in case you haven't read the book, I find toxin actually rather difficult to follow and think through on the fly. And there's another problem with the toxin puzzle, which is it has features that are extraneous to the rational choice problem that one is trying to address, namely features of the nature of intention. So I'd rather use a different example which I think illustrates the same point, and this is the famous case of the Humean farmers. So Alfred's farm is ready for farming, for plowing this week. The adjacent farm belongs to Bertram. Bertram's field will not be ready for plowing until next week. So Bertram says, well, I'll tell you what, why don't I help you now, Alfred, and we'll plow your field together, and next week when it's time to plow my field, you ought to help me, and we'll make a deal. Actually, I think it's Alfred who proposes that deal. Neither farmer can effectively plow his farm by himself, and they will both therefore be better off if they plow their farms cooperatively. The trouble is that if Alfred agrees this week to help Bertram plow his farm next week in exchange for Bertram helping Alfred this week, come next week, it looks as though Alfred will have no reason to follow through on the agreement because he'll already have received the assistance that he was seeking in making this agreement, and now it's all cost and no further gain to him from following through on the deal. But of course Bertram knows this. And if Bertram believes that it's not rational for him to assist Alfred, excuse me, if Bertram knows that it's not rational for Alfred to follow through on this promise come next week, then Bertram will not assist Alfred this week. The difficulty then is that the rational thing to do, or best response, is for Alfred to renege on the deal next week. And knowing this, it is not rational for Bertram to assist Alfred this week. That's the difficulty. Now, 
The best case scenario, of course, from Alfred's perspective, is to receive help this week and effectively renege next week. That would give him his highest payoff. Let's say it would give him a payoff of 16, to make up some numbers. His second choice would be that they cooperate with one another, that he receives help this week and come next week he assists Bertram. They both get help plowing their fields and they both bear some cost of having to help the other farmer. Let's say their mutual utilities from doing this would be 12. Third choice, not a very good one, would be that neither one helps the other. This is not preferred because neither one gets the help with plowing his field. Maybe he has to plow his field by himself and doesn't get it all done, leaving part of the field unplowed. Let's say there would be a utility to Alfred of five from doing this. Worst case scenario uh, is, of course, not a risk here, but it would be from Bertram's perspective to render help and receive no help in return, to be made a chump in short. So we could model the payoffs like this. Bear with me. Alfred's point of view. All right, it looks as though, once you consider this, that the rational thing to do is for them to enter into an agreement and cooperate and then cooperate. Why? Well, the test that Jens uses is one proposed by David Godier, namely that Alfred should think, my life would go better and I will fare better if I cooperate. If I promise to cooperate and then I actually do cooperate, okay, and if I can convince Bertram that I will follow through, then we both receive the benefits of cooperation. The difficulty, of course, is that he will have trouble convincing Bertram because at the choice node, at which the second choice node, at which he must decide whether or not to renege or cooperate, he will have no further interest in cooperating and he will renege, or so best response dictates. Once again, Bertram knows this and so he will not agree in the first place to enter into this agreement. This is where the proposal for chunking one's mode of reasoning comes in. If I decide on what to do, and I'm Alfred, according to the best plan for my life, then I will sometimes have to carry out actions that are in the immediate future suboptimal, but taken from the perspective of making my life go as well as possible will turn out better for me. If I am a constrained maximizer, in short, I will adopt the plan of agreeing to cooperate and then cooperate. Knowing that I'm a constrained maximizer, Bertram will then agree to enter into this deal, will assist me this week, 
And when it comes to deciding what to do next week, I will just stick to my plan. I won't reconsider, given that there are no changed circumstances, and I'll plow his field. This will be a win-win. Unfortunately, this brilliant suggestion uh, presented by David Godier originally in a book called Morals by Agreement and later carried out in a number of papers does not work. There, are a number of there have been a number of different attacks on this solution over the years, but I'm going to show you just one. And my concern is that in taking on Godier's solution here, and tying the case for international law to this solution, Jens has taken on a theory which, though I love it dearly, at present is a flawed theory and has no solution to it. And let me tell you that my, my concerns about this theory are internal concerns. I'm willing to accept, under certain circumstances, the rationality of performing suboptimal actions in furtherance of an overall optimal plan. Unfortunately, there are difficulties with this solution. Let me first say, before I articulate the central difficulty that I plan to focus on, that there are conditions on this problem. Conditions that I think Jens might have do, done well to make a little clearer in his book. In order to even get to the place where this is a problem, you have to assume, number one, that the deal that the Humean farmers make cannot be enforced. Okay? There is no sovereign, there is no law. It's not a legally binding contract that they can go in and sue on if there is no follow through. Number two, you have to assume that there is no repeat play between these players. You have to assume that they are never going to encounter one another again, and they therefore don't have incentive to cooperate based on an ongoing series of interactions. And number three, you have to assume that there are no reputational effects from whether or not they cooperate. People in the community will not be looking at their actions to decide whether or not cooperate, they are cooperators and whether or not to cooperate in the future with them. So this is a single shot case with no reputational effects okay? and no enforcement. That's when the problem arises. Now I'm willing to allow that under conditions that we might call common knowledge of rationality, in this case, it is rational for Alfred to, to enter into the agreement and to follow through with the agreement and therefore rational for Bertrand to assist Alfred this week. C common knowledge of rationality assumes that Alfred is rational, Bertram is rational, and each has knowledge of each other's rationality. This condition is a very strong one. Many game theorists will tell you that they will have nothing to do with the assumption of common knowledge of rationality. I want you to keep that assumption clearly in your mind. I'm going to run, return to it at the end. I hope I have a few more minutes. All right, the problem, even against the background of common knowledge of rationality, assuming that the three conditions that I articulated before hold, is the problem that I call the problem of risky assurances. So let's assume now that the fields are not of equal size. Okay. In fact, Alfred's field is uh, twice as large as Bertram's. I got the other. Bertram's field is twice as large as Alfred's. And so what they decide is to enter into a deal in which they flip a coin. And that deal looks like this. <laughs> 
If Alfred were to cooperate after losing the deal, he would have to assist in plowing Bertram's field, but he would have no assistance with his own. Therefore, it's a case in which his life would not be going better were he to lose the deal. Okay. This is a risky assurance. So it's not the case that in any case in which we have an assurance, if we have a risky assurance and we have a gamble embedded in the assurance, that our life will go better if we follow through on the assurance. Sometimes like the case of deterrent threats, it will be worse for us if we follow through on an assurance because our lives will turn out worse than had we never entered into the assurance in the first place. In this case, Bertram could end up having to choose between no cooperation which would be the deal that he would have if he never entered into the agreement in the first place, which would give him a yield of five, and breaking the deal, um, in which case he, and sticking to the deal, in which case he would be even worse off. So that the deal that involves following the plan could end him up at his worst alternative. He would not necessarily fare better by following the plan. Okay, I hope that's clear enough. You get the overall point. All right, what do we say about this then? If following the plan can leave one worse off than it would had one never entered into the plan in the first place, it looks as though often it is not rational to cooperate. Now, Jens briefly addresses this problem um, but doesn't fully realize the magnitude of it. He takes Godier's word for it that this problem is primarily limited to threats, but in the case in which it appears to be affecting assurances, Jens makes a move which I think is not legitimate, which is to say that there is new information when an individual discovers he has lost the bet. However, the argument that we made before applies right to the beginning, which is that if Bertram knows that Alfred may renege if there is a losing gamble, then he will not agree to enter into the deal in the first place. It's not new information. Okay. So let me wrap up because it took a little too long to articulate that. If this is true then, the move to apply Gotarian thesis of rationality would be unhelpful to the case of establishing the bona fides and the normative authority of international law. Assurances, unfortunately, are never going to be sure bets. It's never going to be the case that if we enter into reciprocal cooperative arrangements, we will know for certain that our efforts will pay off.
We can never be certain that our lives will go better, and states will never be certain that their welfare will be better by entering into a reciprocal assurance relationship than reneging from those relationships or those deals. And that makes using the theory of cooperation rather difficult in the case of international law. Furthermore, the three conditions that I said in the beginning were requirements in order to make sense of the application of rational choice in this context, namely that there is no enforcement, no repeat play, and no reputational effects, in fact fail to hold in this case. As Jens himself says, there are sanctions in international law, though he points out there are different kinds of sanctions from those that hold in domestic law. And as he says, there is a kind of a sovereign. If this is true, then the use of Gotarian rational choice theory in this context would be particularly inapposite because it wouldn't be necessary. If there is enforcement, then all of this stuff is irrelevant because we can enter into a deal and just have it enforced. This is, of course, the problem that affected Hobbes' theory. You couldn't figure out, and commentators have puzzled for years, about whether or not the creation of the sovereign in Hobbes' theory is irrelevant. If the sovereign is there to enforce deals, then why do we need the theory of rational choice, and why do we need the disposition to cooperate? Of course, if there's no sovereign there and we can still get cooperation on the basis of rational choice alone, then why, in what way have we argued for the rationality and the normative authority of the sovereign? So I would suggest that Jens's theory has a similar problem, which is that in attempting to use the strength of rational choice theory to establish the normative authority of the sovereign and international law as sovereign, he runs into the difficulty that international law is either irrelevant because we can get cooperative results on the basis of rationality alone, or impossible to establish because we can't. So. Um, thanks for coming. Let me say at first that I'm uh, doubly indebted to the panelists today. Um, first, for their um, searching commentary on my, my work um, uh, today, but also because each one provided valuable assistance when I wrote the draft of the, of the book. Um, Professor Ev Evangelista um, gave me a... Um, crucial reordering of the chapters when he read a first draft of the book, which I didn't see when I had first constructed the, the manuscript. And upon his suggestion, I realized it was a, it was a brilliant idea, and I Im implemented it immediately. Uh, Professor Wendell provided uh, a very important commentary on my manuscript when it was workshopped at an earlier event here at the law school last year, which was very helpful for clarifying my argument. And then Claire also has been pushing me on various aspects of rational choice theory for several years, and that informed my writing of the manuscript as well. So I appreciate their continued assistance in my scholarly work. Let me respond briefly to some of the comments I've had here. I just want to take a couple of minutes, and then we can open it up to questions from the audience. <clears throat> Matt, I think I'd like to uh, take up your invitation to say a little bit more about the causal account in this book and what is the relationship between these uh, intellectual arguments from these scholars and the policy outcomes that obtained during the Bush administration and the years when the United States was most hostile and skeptical to international law. So I'm very careful in the book, and I want to be careful as I go out and talk about the book in public not to overstate the causal argument. Right? The structure of the argument is not, right, the United States was incredibly faithful to international law. We are a cooperative partner. We were basically right there with Germany, Brussels, right, uh, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, um, and then a few intellectual uh, skeptics of international law came upon the stage and they ruined it for everyone and the result is the disaster that we have now today, right? That's certainly not my view. It would be a caricatured 
caricatured view um, of the role of these intellectuals, right? Um, and I think what I have is a kind of intermediate position. I think that ideas are important, but I don't want to exaggerate it um, in either direction, right? So on the one hand, you can take a kind of you know, Hegelian idealist position that ideas are so important that they're the only thing that matters, right? And I think that's certainly an exaggeration. But you can also swing too far to the other end of the spectrum, which says right, that ideas never matter and that all that matter is policy outcomes and the kind of military posture of the country and, and intellectual arguments have no role in this whatsoever. I think both of those have got to be wrong. And I think I start from a position in the middle of the spectrum which is that ideas provide a kind of intellectual foundation for policy positions that may be chosen for other reasons. But the intellectual foundation is nonetheless very important and necessary. And the way I'd put it is this. Um, <clears throat> these intellectual arguments that suggest that international law is not binding, right, or is not enforceable, or is not real law, these arguments have made it comparably easier for American presidents to ignore international law when it doesn't suit them. That isn't to say that they wouldn't have ignored international law anyway, but it's to say that it made it easier for them to do so because it reduced the costs of noncompliance. Right? I mean, think about it. If a president says, or if an American politician says, there is some aspect of international law that's inconvenient, right, and I want to right, avoid it if possible, and you're operating against a set of background norms which say that international law isn't real, norm, real norms, isn't real law, then you can sort of view charitably the president's attitude that he wants to skirt legal responsibilities on the international stage, right? It doesn't seem so brazen for someone to be ignoring something that isn't real law. And I think something like that is operating in this uh, situation. The way I'd put it is that these intellectual uh, arguments provide aid and comfort for those who, for other reasons, might be interested in ignoring international law. And for that reason, I think we have to take these intellectual arguments seriously. Um, Professor Wendell, in his commentary, um, uh, I think very helpfully explained the way in which the new realists uh, and their arguments that I attack in this, in this book are in some ways an outgrowth of the Holmesian argument um, and the Holmesian realism. And I think um, Brad articulated that in a way that um, is even more succinct than what I did in the book. And so I'm very, I'm very grateful for the way he unpacked that intuition. Um, Brad has asked me, well, do commitments always have to be followed? Do plans always have to be followed? In what circumstances um, could we sometimes unwind our commitments, and how much do we have to stick to a plan? Um, my response to that is I can't, I can't fully work out an, uh, 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 an answer to that important question, but I would say that it's somewhat implicit in the notion of a plan that it's sticky, right, that one doesn't abandon it at any cost, right, and if one has a plan that one defects, at the drop of a hat, then in a sense it becomes no plan at all. Right? The whole idea of a plan is that you don't reevaluate it every moment in time. If your uh, plan isn't sticky, then really what you're doing is just deciding at each moment in time what you ought to do. Now, I think in some circumstances it is important to reevaluate a plan and to depart from it, and that may include in some situations right, defecting from a uh, assurance that you might have given uh, at the beginning of the situation. But the reasons why one ought to abandon a plan is because some sort of circumstance has changed, right? The agent has acquired new information, right? The situation has changed, right? Um, you can sort of think about this in terms of the doctrine of changed circumstances that you have in contract law or other areas of the law. If a contract or an agreement emerges from a particular set of conditions and those conditions no longer hold, then there's an argument to be, uh, to be made that the original arrangement um, doesn't hold force. Uh, and I think something like that is going on here, right? If circumstances have changed, if new information has been obtained, then it might make sense to abandon a plan. It's not a reason to abandon a pan plan just because one has already received all of the benefits and what remains is all of the burdens. That's not a reason to abandon a plan. That's simply the order of the plan proceeding in the way that you had anticipated, and you can't abandon halfway. Or if you are, 
you're not engaging uh, uh, in a rational course of action. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Claire's comments uh, are <clears throat> perhaps the most uh, complex to respond to, and I can't do them full justice in this brief uh, time period, but I do want to make a few brief comments. Uh, Claire, in her comments, very helpfully asked um, whether or not the real target here should be a new realist um, uh, defense of executive authority, right? And perhaps what we should be concentrating on is the new realist's attack on legislative primacy and judicial authority and their full-throated defense of executive authority. Um, I see these two as being very connected, and this isn't uh, by way of disagreement with Claire. I think we're, we're agreeing with this, but these are two instantiations of the same problem. Um, if you think of constitutional law theory, right, um, we often focus on separation of powers, right? And when we talk about separation of powers in constitutional law, we often talk about horizontal and vertical separation of powers, right? They are different, but they are part of the same larger thing, which is the separation of powers. So uh, normally in constitutional law, we talk of the horizontal separation between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches, and then we contrast that with vertical separation of powers between, right, uh, the federal government and state governments. Those two are right, on two different axes, but they share some particular concerns regarding the relative allocation of power between the different entities within the United States government. Right? The same thing is going on here. You're talking about the horizontal separation of powers between the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch. But in contrast to constitutional law theory, we usually talk about the vertical separation between the federal government and something below it, which is the states. Now we're talking about a vertical separation between the United States and something which is above it, which is the international community or supranational institutions. And what is the appropriate sort of separation of authority between those two? Um, that's, I think, the question that these new realists are talking about, and they have a particular argument, I think, of vertical separation of powers, which is that the United States should never be giving away any separation of power in the vertical realm above the United States, because they have this kind of hypersensitive focus on sovereignty. I see those two as being ultimately connected, and I think they need to be um, discussed in the same vein, and that's one of the things I tried to do in the book. Um, the last part of, the, of Claire's comments, which I'll just take one minute to, to respond to, I have to think about it um, more carefully. Um, she very uh, helpful, helpfully, I think, explained why these risky assurances are very difficult to model and why it's difficult to explain why it would be rational to comply with them. Um, I think my answer to this has to do with the nature of the background conditions that she articulated, which are that uh, there's... Um, no reputational costs, right, that this is a one-shot game, uh, that there's no enforcement, there's um, certain attitudes about rationality. I agree with her that those conditions aren't always the same in international law. And the way I put the point is, it, is this. In some ways, in the book, I'm more aggressive than I need to be. Right? And I don't think that that's a problem for my account. It just perhaps shows that I shouldn't have been so ambitious. Right? One thing I try and do in the book is I try to explain why it would be rational to comply with a plan in a one-shot game. Right? I think that's in the most ambitious form of the argument, but I don't need to provide a knockdown answer to that question in order to save international law from being a sinking ship. Right? All I need to show is that under the conditions that obtain in the international system, it would be rational to comply with the plan. And in the international system, as Claire points out, there is some enforcement. There's not as much enforcement as in national law. And importantly, I think this is the key point, there are reputational costs in international law because it's almost always a repeat player game, right? There are several instantiations of the game. It's very rare to have a one-shot game in international law. Now, of course, I think that doesn't fully show that what we're talking about here is irrelevant because the problem is there aren't the the same level of reputational costs that there are in the domestic system. There isn't the same level of enforcement as there is in the domestic system. Um, and so you have to come up with an explanation for why it's rational to comply when there's no world government and there's no sovereign to enforce these agreements, at least not enforce them in the way they are uh, in, the, in the domestic system. 
Uh, as a final point, there's a certain level of ambivalence in my project order over which kind of um, specific theory of rationality I want to support. Um, I go through the book a, a sort of lengthy discussion of using plans, using strategies, or using dispositions as the appropriate uh, sort of mechanism to explain why states comply with international law. And I really am ambivalent as to which of those particular concepts is the best to explain compliance with international law. Um, a lot of what we've been discussing here involves whether or not plans can be the appropriate uh, criteria or the appropriate concept. Um, but I move back and forth between them, and I'm not sure I'm committed to one over the other. And I would say that actually the language of dispositions, of saying that right, if you're in a community with, another, uh, with a sufficiently large number of people who are disposed to follow international law, then it's rational to comply with international law. That may actually describe the situation we're in in the international community, that unlike the United States, most states are disposed to comply with international law. And I think that also... <sighs> Um, uh, dovetails quite nicely with what a lot of international relations scholars say, which is that most states have a kind of disposition for following international law, and a lot of the elites in most states have a particular disposition towards complying with international law because it's hardwired into their characters. They've just been socialized in a way. They've gone to law school, right? They've uh, operated in the higher ranks of government where compliance with international law is just a disposition they've acquired. And because of that, it's rational to comply with international law. So I thank you very much for your attention, and maybe we have a few minutes for a couple of questions. Thanks, Jens. We probably do have time for a couple of questions, so Steve. Um, this is a, a question about the relationship between um, Gotian, I'll call it Gotian morality and more traditional conceptions of morality, uh, because you said in your comments that if you, the argument doesn't work, then the normativity of international law sinks. Um, and I would suggest that people like Posner, uh, you know, they exist in academia, uh, but in the world at large, uh, people believe in morality. They are not positivists. They may be intuitionists. They may be deontological. They may be teleological. They may be religious. They may not know which of those they are, and they may be a combination of those. My question is, I understand the project of saying, you people are arguing a theory of rationality, and on your own assumptions it doesn't work. What I'm wondering is, are you just bracketing more conventional uh, conceptions of morality that would be used, for example, in our philosophy department to attack those? Uh, or do you yourself buy into notions of morality? And I'm wondering also whether, to the extent you do, whether that's a product of focusing on international law, where it makes a whole lot of sense from a social perspective in describing what nations do to use rational choice or some formulation of rational choice. But the, the fact that that's true doesn't necessarily mean, it, I would argue, doesn't mean at all uh, that that is a good basis for a normative description of how nations should behave. I think that's a question for me. Um, so uh, that's a very um, that's a very helpful um, a very helpful comment. Um, I don't mean in any way to crowd out other explanations for the moral requirement, right, to engage in international relations in a particular way, or a moral obligation, right, to comply with certain normative requirements on the international stage, right. So I think. Partly what I'm doing here is this is a response project, right? So I'm taking, right, a certain set of positions as given, and then I'm articulating a response to them. And that wouldn't necessarily be the way I would set up the discussion if I was working from a blank s uh, slate, right? But on a deeper point, um, right, there, there's been, I think, a shift in our discourse about international relations over 
the last generation. So I think in previous generations it was much more common to ask whether a certain international policy was moral or not. And I think you saw this a lot during the Vietnam War, right? Is it is it is the Vietnam War just? Is it is it the right thing to do? And uh, in our generation now, and I think this has only intensified in the last 10 years, is that the discourse has become exceedingly legalistic. So instead of asking whether or not the war in Iraq was moral, people ask, was it legal? And that almost crowds out discussions of, of morality. And so, I mean, this puts, I think this shift in the discourse puts uh, international law on the center stage. And I think there's a kind of temptation to ask, well, why should people be complying with international law, uh, given that there are these sort of uh, puzzles of, of rationality and no sort of central government uh, to enforce it. But that by no means is meant to crowd out sort of deeper moral questions. Anybody else doing the ooh, ooh, ooh thing? Uh, please all join me in congratulating Jens on the publication of his book and thanking our panelists for their comments.